Uh, welcome to our Thursdays with Noma. Um, before we begin, as uh, is our custom here, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Noma's Art Stroll Coordinator, Martin Collins, who has a special statement to share with all of us tonight. Martin, you're up. Good evening, Naria, Michelle, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us tonight on another edition of Thursdays with Noma, sponsored this evening by Aqua Marina an intimate Washington Heights restaurant offering authentic and delicious Italian food with a large variety of seafood options for over 20 years on West 171st Street and Broadway. The restaurant expanded a few years ago and underwent a complete renovation. The mainstay of the restaurant, delicious Italian cuisine, is overseen by the owner, Omara Reyes, who turned her passion for food into a hit cooking show on local cable TV. Aqua Marina boasts a daily lunch specials and a very popular early bird special with reduced price dinner menu options starting at 4 p.m. weekdays. Aquamarina supports numerous pro-community efforts, including the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance annual Uptown Arts Stroll. We are grateful to and thank Omara Reyes and Aquamarina for sponsoring tonight's Thursdays with Noma and George Nelson Preston. Naria, back to you. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Aqua Marina, for your support. Good evening, good evening to all of you. Uh, it is so nice to be here again uh, with you. Uh, this uh, among this sort of extraordinary network of artists and non-artists, supporters, and friends. Uh, my name is Miriam Leva Gutierrez, and I am the executive director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. Um, before we begin tonight, which I can't wait to do, uh, I'd like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for supporting this program. Um, and as you know, for those of us who have joined us week after week uh, or on occasion, this program is an opportunity to get to know our amazing uptown artists. It's an opportunity to learn something new or unexpected about these artists. And it's especially a chance for all of you to ask questions and engage in conversation with our featured artists. So please, as always, we encourage you to ask your questions in the chat and we will be sure to give you a chance to ask them directly. I am so very honored to have with us tonight the extraordinary Dr. George Nelson Preston. Um, and before we begin, I just wanted to say that tonight's introduction could not possibly do justice to Dr. Preston's storied and illustrious career as an artist writer, poet, curator, critic, collector, world traveler, avid baseball fan, and scholar of African art, all which span over six decades. But I'm gonna give it a shot, um, so here we go. Born in New York City to a family of artists and musicians, Dr. Preston began his studies at the famed LaGuardia High School. A mere two years after his graduation, he participated in his first group show at ACA Gallery, earning an honorable mention the first of numerous prizes. While at the City College of New York, where he earned his BA in Fine Arts and English Literature, he was recommended for a Yaddo Fellowship and became a member of the Phoenix Gallery, the artist-run gallery on 10th Street, where he had his very first solo exhibition in 1959. Around the same time, he visited Cuba as a writer, the first of many trips to the island where he interviewed Pablo Neruda and met the legendary Celia Cruz and Benny More. Shortly after he spent time in Mexico, studying the archeological zones of Montalban and Sahim, Tenochtitlan and Teotihuacan to name a few. Thus began his too many to name trips outside of North America, including Europe, Central and South America and Africa. In 1966, he entered the program in primitive and pre-Columbian art in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University on a title for Fulbright for the study of non-Western art, languages, and culture, earning both his master's and doctorate degrees. While there, he studied African, Amerindian, pre-Columbian, oceanic art, and anthropology, an experience that, according to him, quote, influenced his fondness for surprise the unexpected and unconventional juxtapositions and media, themes that he has continually explored throughout his life and work. The 70s and 80s were incredibly prolific periods for Preston, who continued his many world travels, taught courses in African art at Cooper Union, published widely on classical and contemporary African art, participated in numerous group shows and exhibitions, and conducted extensive fieldwork in Ghana, becoming a research affiliate at the Department of Archaeology at the university there. In 1987, he visited Brazil, 
a trip that informed an important body of his own work and that led to significant collaborations with Brazilian artists and museums. In 1988, he was named chair of the Graduate Fine Arts Program at CCNY. In the 90s, he continued to build his art collection, exhibited at multiple group shows, including Notas Brasileiras and the Baseball Show, presented his work in various conferences and symposia, and curated important exhibitions in New York, Argentina, and Brazil. In 2001, he was promoted from the junior chieftaincy of the Anco Bia and installed to an Akan chieftaincy. In 2006, he established the Museum of Art and Origins on 162nd Street in New York City that houses hundreds of classical and contemporary African artworks. In 2014, he was awarded the Career Achievement Award from the Art Alumni of the Alumni Association of the City College of New York, and in 2016, he was elected by the Academy of Brazilian Art to its newly created Pierre Bourgi Chair. In the same year, he exhibited paintings and drawings in his solo exhibition entitled Journeys of an Afro-Atlantic Afro Envoy, George Nelson Preston, at the Wilmer Jennings Gallery, the curator for which I am fortunate enough uh, to have in my possession. Indeed, we are all so fortunate to have Dr. George Preston with us tonight. And I should also say that if our conversation on Tuesday is any indication of how tonight will unfold, I can only say that we are all in for a treat. From an intellectual and just about every other perspective, it's an honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. George Preston. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have a video. If we can cue that up, we'll give we'll get going with that. Michelle. Board issue. I beg you to ask um, Ogun let's, let's see. to open the way for us. <laughs> Michelle, how are we doing here with the video? Yep, here we go. Welcome. Welcome to my home, to my museum, to the shrine. The Historic House Museum, Museum of Art and Origins, a shrine to my family and to my ancestors, a living shrine in the form of the art you'll see here and the art that I make. And we'll have a special visit to an inner sanctum that very few are allowed to see. The priests of Ghana told me not to show it idly. So I hope I am obeying. I go, I go, I go. Amen. So here's the shrine of my ancestors. This is where I come for peace of mind and to gain strength from the distractions in the world. I bring my closest friends here so that we lean on each other. We are the people who lean on each other. This is an altar to into me. Into me means it cannot. Into me is the shrine of one of my mentors. Nana Okonfo Achianza. And this is a surrogate, a subaltern shrine for Into Me. Into Me protects you against iron and protects people who use iron. So we say, Si come into me. She come into me, she come into me. A blade 
cannot kill you. A blade cannot do it. A blade cannot do it. A tool, a gun, a tool into me, a tool into me, a tool into me. My father worked with his hands. These are all vintage tools from the early 20th century. These are my bracelets from into me. To me, the human side. 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 The human My grandmother, my aunt, my mother, my aunt, captain in the United States Army, the Nurses Corps, 1945. My Lifetime Achievement Award from the Art Alumni of City College. I offer this to my mother's ancestors. On this altar, the first drawing that I did with my father helping me when I was about eight years old, Here is my wife Melanie and I sitting in state at one of the annual ceremonies to honor the ancestors. This is in the semi-autonomous Aquapim state in the town of Mamfi, Ghana. In my father's side, If you start at the very top, the matriarch, the power of my left hand, on the mother's side, the power of my right hand, on the left side, the power of my left hand, of my father. And Sa, at Yeso, and saw at Yeso the hand that you put it on something and it does something. So my father's mother and then all of the children, one mother, one father, all of these. This is what they don't want you to learn about in school. We don't hate them, but we hate them for not understanding. It's not the same thing. This is a manila, a copper or alloy. Three of these could buy my ancestors, could buy one of my ancestors on the slave coast in the 19th century. 
Welcome to where the art is made. Look around. An orderly studio is the sign of a perverse mind. <laughs> so let's connect the art that I do with the African art. This is the Kalunga. But it's an ideation. In my work that I'm working on at present, the figures that I derive from the Kalunga pose will occur and reoccur in my work. Um, this is a reconfiguration of the classic European uh, composition for Susanna and the Elders. What I have done here is painted a slumbering Afro-descendant female figure and the Kalunga appearing over here and the title of the painting is Don't Fear Susanna, the Kalunga has sent me. Again, there's this one entitled The Columba Contemplates Castel San Severino. Castel Severino was a slave holding pen uh, in Matanzas, uh, in Matanzas uh, City in Cuba. So in this painting, you see. This is entitled Emblematic Vision of the Middle Passage. Um, and then I have the multiple and interchangeable horizons and shores, vanishing points, wakes of the caravels, all converging and exchanging with each other with the Kalungas upside down, in a world turned upside down. That's wonderful. Um, Thank you so much um, for for sharing that with us. I, I I have I feel like I have I'm overwhelmed by the amount of questions um, that I feel I, I want to ask you. Um, but I want to I want to start a little bit um, about your experience um, in in Ghana. What what led you? to begin your studies there, to do your field work there. Um, can you take us a look and, and sort of that entire trajectory of sort of your early graduate work there and then um, your chieftaincy? How, how, what does is, what is that trajectory look like? And, and, and what has that um, been like um, for you on, on all the various levels that I think that you've experienced um, um, this? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. Um, when I started uh, the graduate program at uh, Columbia, uh, a number of coincidences, uh, you know, converged. Um, it's always never one thing, but a few things that happened. Um, one was that um, I had entered Columbia actually interested in pre-Columbian art because of my you know, travels in Mexico. Uh, but one of the great, two of the great uh, Africanist scholars were teaching at Columbia, uh, Douglas Fraser and Paul Winger. Um, so that's a factor. Uh, also by serendipity, uh, I was walking down Madison Avenue one day and I ran into an African courier who had a suitcase full of antiquities. And um, 
he was looking for the deal of Merton Simpson, uh, who was a friend of mine. Simpson was out of town. So I said, well, show me what you have. And uh, he took me to his hotel and there were all these terracotta figures and heads, statues. And I said, where are these from? And he said, Ghana. Now, at that time, um, African art history knew nothing about Ghana. Uh, um, the cultures there, for the most part, are hierarchical. They are um, centralized authorities. They're very similar to European states. And uh, we have an expression, which is that uh, centralization drives the mask to the chest. In other words, the spirits that mask represent um, are succeeded by the hierarchical political figures and the mask becomes ornamental. But here were all these objects that were not accounted for in any of the art historical record. That's what led me to Ghana. Uh, that, I mean, it's, it's so fascinating because I think um, you're right. I mean, you, you sort of enter into Colombia, you know, and, and you know, pre-Columbian art was also in its sort of early um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, stages as well as, as, um, as a field. What were, um, what were some of your, uh, who were, or who were some of your mentors and some of your influences while you were there? I know you, you talk a little bit about attending courses uh, with Meyer Shapiro. Um, and, and certainly, you know, you had not only um, the professors and uh, that you interacted with, but also your classmates um, and, and sort of, can you tell us a little bit about some of those sort of early influences from, from sort of from the academic perspective, because I know you also have, you know, you talk about your parents also as mentors too. And so you've sort of, you know, along the way have experienced that sort of from multiple um, uh, perspectives, but sort of in those early years when you're experimenting with this sort of new field, um, sort of how did you, how did you sort of find your way um, in this field that, as you said, was not represented in the art historical literature? Well, um... Wingert at that time um, was a uh, proponent of what we call the style area approach. Uh, there were some scholars before him um, and what they focused on was trying to understand what came from where based on the stylistic attributes of these of these objects, which is the way it's done in Western art history. Okay, the, the Venetians have a particular kind of color. Um, Michelangelo is obviously not a very good painter, but uh, he's a terrific uh, sculptor who knows how to draw figures that look like sculpture and then he puts the color in. Uh, and, you know, that's a particular, you know, approach. Um, but we, but um, with Shapiro, um, one of the things that uh, interested me, uh, and I was attending lectures of his that were completely out of my field, um, Romanesque uh, art, but he was very interested in um, three aspects of an image, uh, what we call the surround, the field, and the figure. And he was able to determine where the origin of various manuscripts based on what was emphasized, the surround, the field, or the figure. And so he would localize things as you know, coming from England or from France, so forth and so on. What interested me about this was the way the Japanese uh, basically don't have a surround. Uh, and, you know, they, they have figures that move in and out of the, the periphery, actually. And um, uh, also, I had been 
working on the shifting what we call picture planes. In, in other words, working on the painting in a way where it wasn't confined by the four sides of the canvas. And the way I had to do that was to just break up uh, different levels of spatial uh, uh, configurations. So like, for example, in this particular painting, uh, there isn't really a horizon. There's several horizons that are interchangeable and some of them are upside down. Uh, there's a foil uh, that I use of convention, conventional ordinary perspective, which you see in the, what I call the wake of the caravels, the wake of the slave ships. But, 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 that, but that's a foil against the, the shifting horizons and the upside down skies um, and the, the mutability of the, 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 the picture plane in, in, multiple, in multiple renderings. Um, and um, then um, you saw two figures on the outside. You, you, I often have figures on the, the outside where they're not in the field, the middle of the field itself, but they are coming outside. So this is entitled Somewhere Between Sicasso and Martinique. Sicasso was a slave uh, holding center in the Northern Ivory Coast. Um, these on the, each side of the painting are two, uh, are my reinvention of two uh, Senufo primordial ancestors. Uh, somewhere between uh, Sicasso, where the slaves were brought down to the coast, uh, put in the boats, and then in this instance sent to Martinique. Um, I have figures uh, committing suicide by, you know, jumping into the, the ferment, uh, the firm, firmament. Okay. Um, this is entitled. Um, after three months, no, I'm sorry, after two months of evading the British squadrons, we were surprised by the hills of Rio de Janeiro. I think there was a there was another um, Michelle, another uh, image um, that you that you sent um, to us, um, and. Uh, Let's see, do we have that one? Yeah. Well, we can, uh, um, I think that was, yeah. well, that's related, but that's, uh, yeah. This is an evocative image. It's, it's part of the um, wake of the caravels. Um, and it's entitled uh, La Pesadilla de Capitanos Luis y Montes. Ruiz and Montes were the captains of the Amistad uh, slave ship, which was uh, captured by the slaves and um, ended up adrift off the coast of Rhode Island. Um, and um, this is an evocative uh, seascape of the mood of that event the night uh, prior to the capture of the ship. Can you tell us a little bit about the materials that you use? Because I know um, it has several, you use several different uh, um, materials. So can you tell us a little bit about, about that? Yeah, um, well, primarily I, I work in oil on canvas, but um, I also use a, a cut paper. Um, I combine um, drawing, uh, uh, sometimes I um, uh, paint, wait a minute, my, my assistant here, my left, my right hand is trying to tell me something I'm leaving out. Hold on, what is it? Loud? What? Oh. Okay. Um, 
And um, I, I use a, a cork um, uh, uh, sometimes. Um, in this particular painting, um, you see starfish, actual starfish, um, which represent the floor of the ocean, uh, um, the undersea uh, ossuary of, of bones of the slaves. Uh, Baraka refers to the underground um, railroad of bones. Um, I often use um, spray enamel, which I then blend into the figure uh, to give it a, a you know a mystical um, effect. Uh, so in, in this painting, there's oil painting, uh, there's cork, and uh, there the leaves that you see that represent the desiccation of the the forest and the desiccation of culture. Um, some of those are drawn in and some of those are cut paper that's then applied to the painting. And, and I think you've also, you use uh, human hair at times in some of these uh, works as well. What was that? Human hair? Yes. As well? Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I, I use uh, human hair um, because uh, and it's uh, it's uh, it's black hair. It's uh, it's Afro descendant hair uh, because it's very charged. It's right. it's charged with uh, all kinds of um, of, uh, of implications. And um, I remember um, I was giving a tour of of some of my work at the Museo Afro Brasil in uh, São Paulo. Uh, and I have a work there in, entitled um, uh, In Pluribus Obama. And uh, it's a wood, it's a multimedia uh, relief. Uh, and there is a image of Obama's profile uh, on the coin. And um, his hair is rendered with human hair. And so one of the visitors to the museum said, why, why did you put uh, hair there? And I said, because I wanted people to see the hair on the head of the man who is the most powerful man on the planet at this moment. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, it, it's, I mean, there's just, I think, in the history of our, you know, hair and, and sort of how it's depicted um, and, and what it suggests um, is, is, is... Well, here's another one with the... Um, Right. Human hair. Uh, now, now this, that this is a reconfiguration of uh, Filippo Lippi's um, uh, man and a woman at a, a casement window. Ah, yes, I see that there. Yeah, and <laughs> um, and again, you see my interest in multiple levels of the picture plane being fragmented and put together and turned upside down and. On, on, on top of each other. Uh, this is a tribute to my wife. Um, one of the uh, tropes in my work is uh, the, the uh, back and forth between the, the living object and the artistically rendered object, mm -hmm. um, between the monument and the living shrine. Uh, so uh, here, um, I rendered her as a, um, a uh, Punu uh, mask from um, Gabon. Um, and then in another figure uh, with human hair, um, which is rendered as more like a, as a work of art, um, I, I put the human hair there. And the title of this painting is How I found the two greatest Punu figures in the world by simply ambushing them inside of Fra, Fra Felipe Lipo's window. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. I think, I think we have a question um, and I'm gonna ask uh, to unmute um, and I'm, I'm, I don't wanna mispronounce your name. Um, is it, Asma. 
Oh, there Whoa. You go. <laughs> Asthma. Hello, everyone. Asthma. It's good to see you. It's good to see those who are even unseen. Greetings to my professor, who I appreciate because I met him at City College, but I learned later we both attended the High School of Music and Art. I'm a dancer and I'm also a percussionist. And so that has to do a lot with time and space. And so I was appreciating your composition and found them relevant to me as a composer of a movie. And I don't know if that's a question. It's just an acknowledgement. And maybe you can as it, say it, anything what, about it. it. I don't know if it's a question, but it tells me that somebody knows what I'm trying to do. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful um, uh, contribution. I think, um, you know, I, I, I sort of want to return um, to this idea. I, I think, you know, throughout your, your career and your life, um, you know, you, you've, um, you, you've had such a, um, a, a rich, um, life and, and then career, but you've also, um, you've traveled extensively. Um, and, you know, I, I think you sort of dialoguing in that last um, image, for example, with the Renaissance, with the early Renaissance. And of course, the early Renaissance sort of obsessed with the idea um, of, of space, right, or, or of, of perspective. Um, what are, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about what are some of these works of art? You know, who are some of these artists that sort of over, um, you know, sort of the course of your life um, have sort of intrigued you, have sort of, uh, um, right, so here, so here we have another kind of, you know, dialogue here um uh with with this with with this uh image for example um you know it looks a little bit like a Ghirlandaio, for example um how what are what are some of those kinds of uh, um sort of works or those artists that that have sort of drawn you in um and and sort of allowed you um to sort of engage in in your own work well I'll start off by telling you what is my ultimate art fantasy. Oh, let's hear it. I am the owner of a renovated Roman villa that overlooks Leptis Magna in Libya. <laughs> renovated into a, um, an octagon for four alternating with a solid wall and then a, and then a floor to ceiling window. So, so, there are, so there are four enormous windows and four enormous walls. On the floor is an enormous Kazakh rug with a predominant Ardebil blue. On one wall is one of the greatest African sculptures of all time, the Great Beery, a head made by an anonymous sculptor of the Fang people from Gabon. On the second wall is Las Meninas by, ah. by Velasquez. And, and see, now you're thinking of that curtain and how that's an entree of space into that and the mirrors in the back and how that plays out in these multiple levels of space in my painting. Okay, so the, the great Beery, Las Meninas, um, the door to the river by de Kooning mm. and Petit Dejeuner sur l'Herbe. Yeah, that works. I think <laughs> I can I can under I, I I just found myself uh, in that wonderful wonderful um, villa. Wow, you know, and I have to say, as a as a as a Baroque specialist, um, you know, Las Meninas is uh, you know I think to me Michelangelo Marese da Caravaggio. 
Oh, yes. He actually, Caravaggio, um, I, I ended up studying Spanish art, but Caravaggio was my first pull into the Baroque. That He was the one who did it for me um, in, in, in sort of undergraduate, uh, you know, the lecture for, as, you know, as someone who had never taken art history class before. Um, the modern, modern uh, um, painter, painter. I'm sorry? Caravaggio. Yeah. A, a, modern painter. Absolutely, and, and Velasquez too, you know, Velasquez, you know, um, incredibly, I mean, he was described as a modern artist, you know, um, by, by you know, his own, his own teacher. And I think, you know, it's part of the reason why the 19th century um, artist loved him so much because he really um, was, 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 was so, was so modern. And, and you talk a little bit about that idea of sort of the real and, um, and, and sort of um, what is, what is painted and what is real. I mean, and this is something I think, uh, you know, Velasquez was doing in, even in Las Meninas, you know, there are these sort of notations um, of, of, of forms. And then there are these other sort of, you know, fully deline delineated um, spaces as well, sort of always kind of, um, you know, sort of pushing the boundaries, I think, of, of perspective and, um, and, and, and reality. Um, it's, it's so uh, um, wonderful uh, to, to, to sort of think about that beautiful um, uh, villa uh, in Rome. Um, I, I want to ask you also about your, um, your, your collecting history, how, how you came um, to be a collector um and and what did you start uh, collecting i think you, you you started sort of collecting pre-columbia you sort of started with maybe some olmec um works and and uh, I started collecting in high school uh, other students work wow <laughs> so you were just it was just well, well I, and some of them became well-known uh um, artists but but uh, mimi gross uh mm -hmm. milder um, um, uh, Peter Bourfain, just just to name a few, Luther Van, um, yeah. but also uh, my, you know, my mother made uh, carved sculpture out of soap, and so soap bars, completely naturalistic, totally naturalistic, uh, and I lived right across the street from the great Charles Alston, who brought me into his studio many times, uh, that, that, that smell, the combination of linseed oil and the smell of African wood. Uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that definitely uh, planted something, you know, I've got to go to Africa. And uh, my, one of my maternal uh, um, Grand uncles was one of the first black merchant marine um, in 1918, uh, 19, 19, 19, 19, 20. And he, he was what we call a race man. And he collected some works. Some of them are just shops, uh, you know, trivial stuff, but he came up with a couple of great pieces. That's wonderful. I think um, Lisa Green has um, a question uh, tonight. Would you like to ask Lisa? Yes, I would. Lisa. Hi, how are you? <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking about like all of, with all of the, the items that you've collected and all the art, like how do you hold your, um, the emotional space with all those charged, you know, all your charged collections? Like how do you hold emotional space for that? Mm -hmm. Um, if that's a clear question. I mean, I think that it seems like you do a lot of rituals for yourself, but I'm just curious about how you maintain that. Uh, well, I would say that um, I'm probably utilizing, unfortunately, maybe about 10% of my mental capacity to begin with. Unfortunately, I think the average person may be using like maybe only two or one percent of it, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so you know, I don't try to take 
everything in at one time. Um, allow things, the right things to come into my mind at the right moment. And um, uh, so I don't know, I can, I, that answers your question, I think. No, it does. It's just, it's very powerful, the work. And like, I mean, I can feel it, like just seeing it, like it's, it's emotional for me. Like, I'm just, so I'm just curious about how when it lives in the space with you, what that like mm -hmm. feels like. So yes, you answered my question. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, you just don't try to take everything in at once, but you allow things to surprise you. Um, and um, I'm always surprised at the fact that someone such as myself, who is supposed to be such a thorough observer, misses things. And, um, uh, <laughs> you know, I see things that, um, you know, I didn't see before. So I think that that's an example of the fact that naturally, one doesn't take it all in at, at one time. Yeah, that's a that's a great that's a that's a great question and 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 such an interesting um, answer. I think that idea of of the process, you know, of looking. You look, you look again. Um, you know, you, you even even in our own lives, sort of as you say, you, you can walk by something a hundred times, um, and all of a sudden you didn't even know there was a, a building there. And you ask, oh, when did they build that? And you know. It's centuries old. You know, we we do that we do that all the time. That's why they, um, that's why they need to uh, abolish the um, what's that line they have when they they line up suspects and they ask a uh, uh, the victim to who's that guy? Is that the guy that did it? The prep line, right? That's a, I mean, they don't even remember. They don't even remember uh, what they wore the day before. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's that's yeah. I think I think that's right. And someone is you know, like you said, is someone who's trained to observe. Who's uh, that, uh, Regina. Yes, Regina. I think has a question. Regina, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. This has been absolutely fascinating, and your house is indeed a studio and a museum. And I was just wondering what your wishes are for when you are no longer in your bodily form, what, and you pass on, what do you hope will happen to your art and your collection? Well, I don't know um, if this house will stay in my family. Um, it is certainly possible because of the, the trust that I have but um, my, but uh, there's a lot of art here, and um, I am interested in donating a large in my lifetime, uh, inshallah, uh, to a historical, historically black college, and um, I think I owe uh, Columbia University. Uh, a certain debt, and Columbia is in a position uh, in terms of where it is physically located uh, to do something important uh, for what we call the community. That's a wonderful um, question. Thank you, Regina, for that. I think Elizabeth also has a question. Elizabeth? How are you? George and I work together at City College and we know each other a long time. <laughs> yeah, we go back further than any of you. That, <laughs> well, maybe not the person that went to high school with you. That, that's really wonderful too. <laughs> but uh, I wonder, George, if you would talk a little bit. I, I have been to your house. I go by your house a lot because I had to go now to the new to the library at, uh, uh, at 160th Street. And um, I wonder if you talk a, a little bit for folks to know about your experience at City College with the students at City College and the, and the social commitments that we all had at City College. Uh, 
to to think to open lives, uh, you know, open lives, and um, just hear a little bit about that for you. Well, you know, the remarkable thing. Well, there are, there are remarkable things about City College, but one is the enormous uh, variety in uh, backgrounds and in levels of um, the kind of ways of seeing and ways of learning that different students bring there. And, um, you know, uh, you, it, it, the thing that I cared most about is the best thing you can do for the poor as Reverend Ike said, would not be one of them. And um, what he meant, um, material poverty. I mean, material and spiritual, mm -hmm. and psychological poverty. And I tried to project myself as someone who was able to shed those poverties and I want you to have what I have. Um, and, but of course you're, you're relating to like many different levels of understanding of competence, so forth and so on. So it's a real challenge, was a real challenge to figure out how to, how to do that. Oddly enough, it was um, Asian students um, and students from other non-Western backgrounds who had a greater affinity at the outset to African art than African American students because the arts of those, my phrase that I've coined, the West and the rest. The, the, the art of the rest is very similar all over the world. The, 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 the tribal art of Taiwan and how it functions in Taiwan society, for example, is very similar to how it works in Africa. But Black American students have been spoiled by a misconception of Christianity. So you have to work through that, you see. Um, you have to explain to them things. You have students coming to you and they, they say something like, uh, what I would do, for example, I would work on perception. You put a piece of African sculpture on the table and, and I say to them, I want you to describe this physically and I don't want you to say anything else about it. Don't try to interpret it. Don't tell me what you think it stands for. Let me see if you can describe this. Somebody says it's an idol. I said, what's an idol? turns out that they don't know what's an idol. I have to explain to them that there are no idols in Africa. I don't know of any recording of Africans worshiping these uh, figures. I asked you to describe it physically, okay? <laughs> and they have a hard time simply doing that because there's so much propaganda in their way that they can't get through to simply say it's it's made out of wood, it's a it's a human figure, um, it's holding so and so, uh, it's red and blue. 
So uh, you say something to them like, um, my mother, my mother was a devout Christian. She prayed every night and she went to church almost every week, did community work. Um, she said, don't look under my bed. Don't tell me what to do with my body. And if a man hits you once, leave. That cross on the wall is not an idol. It's not Jesus. It reminds me of Jesus. It reminds me of the meaning of the sacrifice on the cross. Now, do you understand African art is it's ideations? So, so that becomes one of the main things. But the entree to that is style area, is just talking about the style, just talking about the, the, the form as an aesthetic thing. You see, and then you can get an aunt. Asthma, you remind me of my mother, people in church with those fans and they're waving them fans. <laughs> you know? But that, well, that's a nice fan. That is, that's nice. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's a great that thing. Choreograph that thing. <laughs> that's a great, that was a great um, uh, question. And, and it's true, there's, there's so much value in, in sort of formal analysis. I mean, it's when you, when you begin to observe and you begin to record your observations, that's where the questions come up. That's where you begin, you know, your exploration of, of the context. But um, there's tremendous value at that sort of, you know, initial uh, and, and first fundamental phase of looking and seeing and, and recording um, and, and looking at all of those, those formal, formal qualities. Um, that's wonderful. I, I, we have a, I just realized we, I, I can't even believe we're already at 8.30. That just, it feel like it just zipped by so quickly. We, we have a tradition here at Thursdays with Noma, and that is that we ask what's called sort of rapid fire questions. I'll put up some questions. I think Martin's going to join me tonight. I think he's got a few questions as well. And you just kind of off the cuff um, respond to them. Um, they're intended to be kind of fun, illuminating, interesting, however you want to um, uh, interpret them. So I'm going to ask, and this is a, I think this is a, for you, I think this is a particularly um, challenging question because you've had, um, there's so much breath uh, um, in, 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 your, in your career and um, there've been so uh, many passions um, along the way. But if you had to sort of um, distill some and, and sort of explain what you think your greatest achievement has been, what might that be? Mine? Yes, yours. My mother told me. She said I've been a great son while she was on a deathbed. That I can't think of a better answer. <laughs> That's it. You, 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 you. Yeah, that that win. She said you've been a good son. Keep your hand on the plow. Hold on. Hold on. That's right. Hold That's on. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right, Martin, you're up. You got the next question. George, we were talking earlier today, eight decades in Washington Heights. You're a world traveler who has seen it all. What are your favorite places that you have been and what's the most historic event? Well, the most, let's start with the most historic event. The most historic event is the fact that the South is still fighting the Civil War. Um, now, um, Places that I've been, uh, Tel Teotihuacan, uh, Mexico City, uh, outside of, of, of Mexico City. Um, uh, the Door of No Return at Anamabo in, uh, in Ghana. Mm. Um, for a landscape, 
uh, I would say uh, the Greek islands. Mm. Nice. Uh, the big sky of uh, Colorado. And being at the point in the Arkansas River that is so narrow that I could actually straddle it. Fantastic. From Teotihuacan to Arkansas. <laughs> wow. That's great. That's, that's awesome. Okay. All right. Here's a question that we ask every week. Um, and, and I'm so interested. You sort of explained your, your fa art fantasy um, uh, world or your environment. Um, but if you were having a dinner party and you had to invite three guests, living or deceased, real or fictional, who would those three guests be? One of them would be Nana Ya Asantiwa, the uh, queen mother to Prempa, who uh, resumed uh, the fight against the British when uh, 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 Prempa had been uh, exiled. So she would be one. Uh, Ulysses Grant. Uh, would be one. Grant, uh, Nana Asantiwa, and Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson. Hey. Yes, without, we. Without 42, 45 would not have happened. <laughs> Okay, I, I, yeah, that that is um, that is quite a, a dinner party. We we haven't even we didn't even touch the, your uh, your love of baseball. Um, I, I know that that uh, you and I had a conversation. We were talking about Cuba, and you said that that was sort of the way to resolve everything that's going on in Cuba um, with with baseball. So um, <laughs> I think all you have to do is <laughs> you got you got Havana. that's in my next question. Oh, that's your next question. Go ahead, Martin. Ask your question. Oh. <laughs> George, you've enjoyed, uh, uh, and you've uh, a baseball a member of your family in the Baseball Hall of Fame, a long career. You've enjoyed many successes playing our national pastime and a long and distinguished award-winning artistic career. What are the similarities and differences between baseball and art? Not much. <laughs> you have to hit a round ball with a round bat squarely, make the ball land someplace where nobody can get to it quickly enough, but where everybody is paying rapt attention to it. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you can do that with your art, that would be, be good. But about uh, Cuba, yeah, okay. Hogin, uh, Matanzas, uh, um, Santiago de Cuba, Guantanamo, Havana, Pinar del Rio. Just divide those cities up into the American League East, American League West, the National League East, American League West, and all of this nonsense is over. So yeah. that, that, that would be the that would be the four divisions. They play it all out and resolve everything. Yeah, because it, it's a cultural thing that would just break down every, all the, the, the everything else would would follow. Yeah, I, I would. Um... I'm telling you, Kevin McCarthy would break down the Moros y Cristianos. Well, you know, I, I I'd be willing to try anything at this point. So you know. I, yeah. I, I think it's a, let's get it on record. Let's let's figure that out. Um, I think that's a great idea. Okay, our final question for the evening: um, What is your idea of perfect happiness? Gratitude, uh, understanding the value of what you have, and if you, and if you understand the value of what you have, then you can use it to its fullest extent. 
That's beautiful. Well, I have tremendous gratitude for you tonight um, for being here with us. This was really an extraordinary um, evening and uh, we are honored to have had you here with us um, sharing about your art and your, your life. Um, and uh, <laughs> and um, we really are grateful here at NOMA um, that you um, were, were able to, to be with us tonight. So I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank all of you for being here with us tonight as well um, for participating for your interesting thought-provoking questions um, and 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 all of your your contributions um, before we go um, um, Martin I think you have a few closing words that you wanted to, to add so I'll turn uh, the mic over to you I do indeed thank you Naria thank you everyone for joining us tonight on Thursdays with Noma we want to let everybody know that this Saturday July 24th the Dykeman Run Club 10K run starts at the Hudson, former La Marina at the western end of Dykeman Street at 10 a.m. Portions of the proceeds from the race will benefit NOMA. So please see our website, nomanyc.org, to register. We want you to provide us with your feedback on this year's Uptown Art Stroll by taking the online survey. Respond by July 31st to enter our raffle. Please see nomanyc.org for the survey and be sure to read this week's Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance newsletter for many opportunities, grant opportunities for artists, calls for submissions with a $1,250 top prize, and check out NOMA's three exhibitions on display through August 15th at the Hispanic Society Museum, Barrequa College, and Audubon Terrace, all at nomanyc.org. And we invite everyone to join us again next Thursday, Thursday, July 29th at 7.30 p.m., for the dynamic award-winning artistic duo of Andrea Arroyo and Felipe Galindo. That's Thursdays with Noma at 7.30 p.m. next Thursday, July 29th. Thank you all for watching this evening and good night, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>